Hello friends, I am Arpit and I am here with today's analysis. Today is 3rd of May and we are going to deal with three very important topics which are news. First is the US Fed rates unchanged. Fed rates are equivalent to the repo rate here in India. The Central Bank of US, that is the Federal Bank, also releases the monetary, po monetary policy just like the Reserve Bank of India does. Now this has an impact on India. Yes, you heard me right. The US Fed uh, monetary policy has an impact on India's economy. If the US Fed rates are increased, the markets in US will be more attractive and the investors will pick their money from India and go and invest in US, causing a loss to India. If the US Fed rates come down and are down or uh, are below India's interest rates, then the investors will come in India and invest in India, benefiting India. This is how the monetary policy of both these countries are linked. Next is hydropower generation impacted. There are two countries in picture that is, uh, you know, Ecuador and uh, Colombia. There, a lot of reliance on hydropower generation is there. Electricity is produced, a lot of electricity is produced from this relatively a very cleaner source of fuel, uh, source of electricity that is hydropower. But unfortunately, with El Nino into place, this has been impacted. El Nino has caused drought-like conditions, very scanty rainfall, leading to reduced levels in the reservoirs. The potential of hydropower generation obviously will be reduced. Unfortunate is that many countries along with these two countries are solely or largely dependent on hydropower generation and they have not you know, created infrastructure for other sources of electricity. That is the most challenging, I would say, uh, thing which they are facing and, you know, these countries have declared emergencies for themselves. Last is balanced fertilization. Now, if this government, the PJP government comes to power, its ne next big push will be the balanced fertilization or promoting balanced fertilization in agriculture. Now, what is balanced fertilization? It is simply the farmers are supplying all the nutrients whether macronutrients like nitrogen phosphorus potassium or micronutrients like iron zinc and all to the plants in a balanced way generally what farmers do is they apply those inputs which are more subsidized because they get more subsidy it, it is cheap that kind of fertilizer that kind of nutrient and that is only uh, provided and the balance thereby is disturbed in the plant health or the plant nutrition so that needs to be maintained so that the plants grow in a better way and the soil health is also maintained now the first is u.s fed rates unchanged the u.s federal reserve on may 1st said that it is holding its benchmark rate steady now this is happening because despite inflation over there now this u.s fed rates is equivalent to repo rates over here in india repo rate is the rate of interest which the central bank charges while disbursing any loans, short term loans to the scheduled commercial banks. This Fed rate or repo rate here in India is an instrument of monetary policy because the central banks can use this, you know, rate of interest to manage or tackle inflation in the country. If they increase the repo rate or the Fed rates, inflation will be controlled. There will be more suck in of the money supply the investment instruments will become attractive if this repo rate is increased if repo rate increased investments in those instruments will increase if the repo rate decreases then those investment instruments become less attractive so this is the simple i would say correlation between both of them now we have to find out the correlation between fed rates and repo rate if fed rate goes up not federated repo rate, sorry, but federate and the Indian economy. You might be wondering, sir, federate or Indian economy, that is the monetary policy of USA. How can it impact the Indian economy? Yes, it can. There were many economists in the past, like Raghuram Rajan and all, who you know, clearly advocated ki bhai, the monetary policies should be more aligned of the countries because any monetary policy changes in developed countries, especially the US, happening hampers or impacts 
particularly the developing and underdeveloped countries. How does it? Let us see. Now, just imagine a situation where the repo rates, or sorry, not the repo rates, but the Fed rates increases. Fed rate increasing means the financial instruments are becoming more attractive over there. What will happen in this scenario? We will see. Now, in India, foreign investment comes in two forms. First is, it can come in FDI, <coughs> foreign direct investment which is relatively stable. It is an investment done in infrastructure with the objective of generating jobs and all over it. And the next is FII or FPI, foreign institutional investment or foreign portfolio investment. This is volatile in nature. These are the investments done in the stocks. Now, these investments or these investors, when they see that the American market is getting more and more attractive, because of the rise of Fed rates over there, the <coughs> investment instruments have become attractive. So they will simply pull out their money from the Indian market and go to the US, leaving us with less dollars, leaving our rupee to fall, making our imports expensive because rupee will fall, rupee will weaken. And this is how, you know, this is going to impact the Indian economy. It can cause inflation over here. This is what happens. If the Fed rates drop down, then it is lower than, let's suppose, India's interest rates. If financial instruments in India are attractive, so that will lead to increased number of or increased investments into India. So this is a simple correlation which we need to understand. So the details, just like RBI in India, US Fed is the also responsible for maintaining inflation levels in USA. And what is interest rates? Similar to repo rate, that is rate at which the central bank issues loans to the scheduled commercial banks. If interest rates go up, it makes the financial instruments more attractive and urges people to park their money in them as a result, reducing inflation. Benefits to India <coughs> in case of rate cuts. If Fed rates are cut, means if they are lowered, what are going to be the benefits to India? Obviously, more inflow will be there in India. So, as the concept was you know, understood earlier. Fed cuts its policy rates. The difference between the interest rates of the two countries could widen, thus making countries such as India more attractive for currency carry trade. So more, you know, investments in the stock will come into India. A lower rate signal by the Fed would also mean a higher impetus to growth in the US. Now Federal Reserve or Fed Reserve will be lowering the interest rate if it feels that inflation is under control and it can afford to pump more money in the economy. Pumping more money in the US economy will definitely lead to more economic activity over there. So this is, is uh, basically how uh, it is going to be beneficial because if US economy is performing well, so it is going to benefit the entire world. So this is basically what it means. Now, what is the impact on India? On Indian market, if it is released in case of increase, Fed continuous rate hike does not augur well. Obviously, it results in an outflow of funds to US markets. Equity markets are likely to see increased volatility in the next few months. All this is going to happen. On Indian rupee, Indian rupee will fall, means it will weaken. And if Indian rupee weakens, it is going to help Indian exporters at some level. But the imports will become more expensive. Now next is hydropower generation impacted. When I talk about hydropower generation, it is considered to be a source of energy which has relatively very less carbon footprint. Carbon footprint is nothing but the amount of carbon emissions done in any activity related to that particular big activity that is hydropower generation. Now, two countries, Colombia and Ecuador, which relied heavily on hydropower generation are now struggling because they are not able to generate power from this source. When I say that they are not able to generate power from this source, there are reasons behind this and the primary reason behind it is El Nino weather phenomenon, which has reduced the reservoir water levels. Reservoir water levels means what happens in a dam, water is collected, then gates are opened, water falls, on a turbine, the turbine rotates and this generates electricity. Now, if water levels are low, gates are, you know, above 
they will water will not be able to fall down turbines will not be able to rotate and hence electricity will not be able to be produced now ecuador has to declare a state of emergency and institute power cuts neighboring colombia water has been rationed in the capital and the country is halted electricity support exports to ecuador water has been rationed means water supply is is also impacted and it has been uh, i would say regulated people are getting this much amount of water only it has been fixed by the government so all these are this is happening over there now what is the impact of climate change now and you know when we saw is the major culprit but yes climate change has also impacted hydropower generation climate change has caused i would say erratic rainfall drought like situations so both these conditions are you know also not beneficial for the hydropower generation if there are more rainfalls erratic rainfalls suddenly you know short spells of rain and intense rains that will also harm this hydropower generation and if there is you know long spells long dry spells without rainfall that will also harm hydropower generation so hydropower is dependent on water so clearly if there is no water at all then hydropower cannot be used disrupting energy production and stressing energy needs droughts and sudden floods which can also damage dams these sudden floods can damage dams made more frequent and severe by climate change and are therefore increasing the concern for hydropower so this is also one such impact of climate change on this hydropower generation now hydropower generation considered to be a clean source of uh, i would say electricity generation if it is impacted by climate change and let's suppose in this situation the countries are adopting towards generating electricity by burning coal they would be further aggravating climate change so there is going to be this perpetual cycle which can be formed so these countries obviously need to look towards other things now there is a simple i would say correlation more reliance on hydropower generation is equal to more vulnerability those countries which are more reliable means they are not or very less reliable on other sources of electricity generation and in this situation of climate change or no uh, el nino el nino chalo it will it is a i would say temporal phenomenon it is happening for i would say uh, a very specific time period and after a few years it will repeat itself but global warming or climate change is a long term i would say impact and it is here to stay so those kind of countries become more i would say vulnerable countries with a high dependence on hydropower are particularly vulnerable to climate change in africa hydropower accounts for 80% of electricity generation in the democratic republic of congo ethiopia malawi mozambique uganda and zambia many of which are also struggling with severe droughts now in this kind of situation all these countries power generation will be impacted now on top of this high dependence they have limited installed capacity for alternative power generation and limited transmission infrastructure as well to import power now what is the solution for these countries the solution for these countries is simply that they should look for adopting more and more cleaner sources of electricity generation that is solar and wind and india can definitely help them in both it has already formed this international solar alliance which includes the sunshine countries and most of these countries fortunately are sunshine countries so we can help them over here in this scenario and the last piece of news is balanced fertilization now it is basically related to simple basically that psyche of human greed you tend to you know go for those things more which are cheaper especially those things on which the government is providing subsidy so the farmers you know they also you know fell prey to this kind of psychology and you know they went on to purchase more and more fertilizers which were subsidized only they forgot about the balanced i would say nutrition in intake by the plants which had to be there the fertilizers which were more subsidized were more brought by the farmers and applied on the fields thereby disturbing that nutritional balance over there and this is what this topic is about balanced fertilization discouraging farmers from applying too much urea diammonium phosphate or muriate of potash so this is npk urea has nit uh, nitrogen in it this is phosphate 
and this is potash these are the macronutrients these are sub, uh, subsidized and these are the ones which are most applied by the farmers the rest are ignored so the fiscal ended march 2024 saw urea consumption hit record 35.8 million tons 16.9 percent higher than 30.6 million tons in 2013-14 so 10 years ago this was there 30.6 now it is almost 17 percent higher and you know this also indicates towards the fact that subsidy burden has also risen on the government the government came up with one innovative step neem coated urea but first we need to understand that why did the government came up with this innovative step you know people were buying urea urea was subsidized by the government that urea was being used on the fields but that was being diverted for other uses also Jabki, you know those subsidies were meant only for the farmers not for those other places where it was diverted so government came up with this innovation that is neem coated urea the consumption of urea containing 46 percent nitrogen actually fell during 2016 17 and 17 18 which was attributed to the mandatory coating of all urea with neem oil from 2015. why was neem coating done it was intended to check illegal diversion of highly subsidized urea for non-agricultural uses including plywood dye cattle feed and synthetic milk makers all these people did use urea but subsidies were not meant for them subsidies were only meant for the farmers on urea but the farmers were diverting this urea for non-farm use that stopped because for these people neem coated urea was of no use benefits of neem coating urea <coughs> Neem oil supposedly also acted as a mild nitrification inhibitor. Now, nitrification is a process in the plant growth where you know the nitro uh, plants need nitrogen and they you know suck in from uh, the roots. So that process is called as nitrification. Though it helped in mild nitrification, gradual release of nitrogen, improved nitrogen use efficiency in turn brought down the number of urea bags required per acre so the same amount of urea was you know giving better nitrification which led to decrease in the demand of urea which definitely led to the decrease in consumption of urea because it is said that actually fell during 2016 17 and 17 18. now what is nutrient based subsidy now as i said that you know balanced fertilization means supplying the primary nitrogen phosphorus and potassium secondary sulfur calcium magnesium and micro iron zinc copper manganese boron molybdenum these are you know the ty types of nutrients uh, required by the plants in the right proportion they have to be there based on soil type and crops own requirement at different growth stages so this is what balanced fertilization means and nutrient based subsidies basically uh, fertilizers are basically food crops containing nutrients necessary for plants growth and grain yield and we will be giving subsidies on we means the government will be giving subsidies on these fertilizers based on their nutrient composition when was it introduced it was introduced in april 2010 by the previous upa government and was expected to promote balanced fertilization balanced fertilization as we saw already what it is now under it what happened a fixed a per kg subsidy for npk and s subsidy on any fertilizer was thereby linked to its nutrient content the underlying idea was to induce product innovation and wean away farmers from urea dap diammonium phosphate and muriate of potash in favor of complex fertilizers containing npks now earlier the government was giving subsidies on urea dap mop now what the government did government created a complex of npks mixed all these fertilizers or mixed all these nutrients and created a fertilizer and started giving subsidies on them that was nutrient based subsidies and other nutrients in balanced proportion with lower concentrations so other nutrients were also included like micro and small nutrients was it successful now nbs achieved its objective initially between 2009-10 and 11-12 dap and mop consumption declined while that of npks complexes which the government had created 
as I would say a result of nutrient-based subsidy and single superphosphate rose. But NPS failed simply because it excluded urea. Urea was not included in this. And this is one of the major, I would say, fertilizers required by the farmers. Now, coming to the MCQs, what will be the possible impact of US Fed increase if, if the US Fed increases Fed rates? Indian rupee will fall. There will be more inflows of investments into India. Indian imports will become expensive. Which among these three will be the correct combination? You have to find out. Consider the following and mark the correct one. Hydropower generation has been impacted due to El Nino. Hydropower generation has zero carbon footprint. So, which among these statements is correct? Be very careful in answering this question. Which among the following is the primary nutrient for plants? Nitrogen, iron, potash. Completely factual. It is there in your notes as well. Which of the following are benefits of neem coated urea? Uh, so, less diversion of subsidized urea towards non agri sector, better NPKS absorb absorption by the plants. So, again, it is factual. Last is consider the following statements and mark the correct one. Nutrient based subsidy was introduced in 2012 for providing balanced nutrition to the plants. Second, it was not successful because it did not include urea in it. So, this is has to be answered and, you know, can be done very simply. Now, with this, we come to an end of today's session. I will be meeting you tomorrow now with more such informative news pieces. Till then, you guys very well know what to do. Keep studying, keep reading, keep writing and most importantly, keep revising. Namaste. Jai.